This program is made possible by the partners and friends of Bob Yandian Ministries. Coming up on this episode of Student of the Word. Whenever we're coming through problems, if you're coming through a problem right now and you're standing on the Word of God, Jesus just puts his chest out. He doesn't care if he pops all the buttons off. He is so proud of you. And on top of that, when you get to heaven, he's going to rejoice over you like you cannot believe. He's rejoicing right now in heaven when you stand on his promises. We are the joy that was set before Jesus as he went to the cross. Like a mother going through travail before the child is born, Jesus went to the cross knowing the travail he had to go to but we are the joy that was set before him. Why does a woman go through travail? Because she can see already that baby on the other side. Even though the baby's inside of her coming out of her womb, she's already anticipating that thing. And for the joy of what she's going to see, she'll put up with the problems now. For more than 40 years, Bob Yandian has been an expositor of the Bible, making seemingly complicated doctrine easy to understand. Grab your Bible and something to take notes with and study the Word of God with Pastor Bob Yandian. Hello and welcome again to Student of the Word with Pastor Bob Yandian. We're going to wrap up something I started yesterday and talk about the all-sufficient God. We've taken it from Zephaniah chapter 3, and if you want to turn there, I'll quickly do a quick recap for you of what we did yesterday and continue on today. Zephaniah chapter 3, verses 17 through 20. While you're finding that, I'm teaching on an attribute of God, but I've got a a series here right here called Knowing God that gets into all the attributes of God. This will be really enlightening for you. And uh, like I said yesterday, maybe you like a lot of country music, rock music, whatever music you listen to. Maybe you listen to the news all the time on your radio. Listen, if you start listening to the Word of God and make it more part of your day, especially like when you're on the road, going to the office, coming back, going to work, coming back, uh, pastors going to the church, coming back, and make this part of your day rather than all these things because we often think the time in the car should be a diversion. No, it should be a time of just listening. I'll tell you, there'll be some times you want to just stop and start taking notes, pull off the side of the road and pull back on or else get out of your car and run around it a few times. That's a great place to listen to the Word of God. It will totally revolutionize your life. So this will be available. The announcement will come on and tell you how you can have it at halftime. This is everything from the sovereignty of God to the justice of God. It talks about the different attributes of God, his love, his mercy, his omnipotence, his omnipresence, all the different things. But again, it's the attributes of God, knowing God. And again, you'll be blessed by it. So Zephaniah chapter three, verses 17 through 20, the Lord your God is in your midst. The mighty one will save. You don't have to go looking for him. He's right there. He will rejoice over you with gladness. He will quiet you with his love. No matter what distress you're going through, anxiety, his love will remind you he's going to take care of everything. And like a father protecting his children, a greater father than any earthly father we can have, he quiets us with his love and then rejoices over you with singing. I will gather those who sorrow over this appointed assembly, who are among you, to whom its reproach is a burden. Behold, at that time I will deal with all who afflict you. I will save the lame, gather those who are driven out. I will appoint them for praise and fame in every land where they were put to shame. At that time, I will bring you back, even at the time I gather you. For I will give you fame and praise among all the peoples of the earth when I return your captives before your eyes, says the Lord. Zephaniah took something that was happening in his time. And by happening in his time, he simply made it something we can understand today. And what we understand today in our time period, they understood back there. And we have to go back and understand what was it. God, in essence, took front page news of something that was going on at that time, as he did with many of the prophets. They took something going on their day. They applied it to future things that were going to happen. And those things still apply to us today. Here's some things he brought out in that passage of scripture. Number one is, you don't have to search the world for me. I'm right there in your midst. More than that, we have in the New Testament, above he's in our midst, he's inside each one of us. Our body is the temple of the Holy Spirit, something Zephaniah did not understand because as far as he was concerned, that temple in his lifetime was where the presence of God was, but the Holy Spirit moved out on the day of Pentecost, moved into us. So instead of looking out there for all of our answers, we often look to the president, we often look to the Congress, we often look to our mayor, we look to other people, we look to businesses, we look to business leaders. We say, oh, can you help me in this thing? When our deliverance is right here in the midst of us, in fact, what he's telling us, if God can't deliver you, no one can deliver you. You say, yeah, but it's this can only be done by perhaps the mayor. 
put your appeal into God. Go over the mayor's head. Go over the, go over your, uh, your uh, governor's head. Go over your president's head. Go over Congress, Senate. And if there's a world leader, go over his. Go directly to God himself. And when God begins to move, he might work through governors, mayors, others, through friends, through pastors, through other people, and turn that situation around. On top of that, why don't you just leave it to God? He may work in ways you have no idea of. This is what God is telling us. Next of all, he's placed inside of us as temples of the Holy Spirit. He's placed his own presence, the Holy Spirit's presence, Jesus Christ's presence, presence, as well as the Father's presence is inside of us. And we need to understand we have something so valuable inside of us. A question I asked yesterday was this. Do you have much money in your wallet? Do you know how much money's in your pocket? I mean, there's that commercial, you know, you know what's in your wallet. Well, do you know how much do you have in your wallet right now and in your pocket? I'd say 99% of the people out there don't know. You don't just count it all the time. In fact, you take some money out, you buy something, get some change back, throw it in your pocket. You just don't have much, an idea of exactly how much you have in your, in your pocket. But the point of it is, is if you studied it all the time and you pulled it out and once while counted it, you would. Here's your spiritual worth. You have no idea what your spiritual worth is because when's the last time you actually spent time in the Word of God, calculating what you have, calculating what you know. And in essence, you have a wealth in you you have no idea of. You have something so valuable, you have no idea of the worth of it. Again, in God's word, which is his Holy Spirit, he's placed inside of us. He says from that, his love comes, his protection over us, and it cannot be calculated. Let's go to 2 Corinthians chapter 10. This is a verse we ended with yesterday. And here it tells us again, the process. We don't, uh, we cannot allow ourselves to be taken in by the world and by its thought processes. We have to think according to the word of God. We have the mind of Christ. It is the word of God, the word of God. God is the mind of Christ. You say, well, I have a Bible here. No, that's a copy of God's word. God's word is the mind of Christ. I'm offering a series I did right here. You say, oh, that series is Bob. No, that's my thoughts. This represents what's on the inside of me. If all copies of this particular series were to disappear, I could recreate it because it's up here. If all copies of the Bible around the world were burned, and they, the government's laughing at us for the fact that they destroyed God's word. They can't destroy God's word. It's the mind of Christ and it could be completely written all over again. The point of it is you can't destroy the word of God because the word of God is not a book. It is the mind, the thinking of the Lord Jesus Christ himself. And when we start to think his way, we begin to see things his way too. What Zephaniah was saying is quit thinking your way. Think my way. Think of the fact that God's in our midst. Next of all, he's inside of us. Next of all, he loves us with an everlasting love. He rejoices over us with singing. He dances over us. That's how much he enjoys us. And like a mother thinks her child is the greatest child in the whole world. That's what God thinks of every one of us. Like we pull pictures out the first thing we do. We see people, have you seen my grandchild? Have you seen my daughter? Have you seen my pictures of my baby? And I mean, other people might go, uh -huh, but what you're doing is you're bragging on them. Listen, others may not care as much that I'm a child of God, but God does. Man, he rejoices over me. His My picture's all over his wall. You understand that? That's how much he loves me. Second Corinthians chapter 10 tells us how we should be thinking like Zephaniah. It's kind of like Zephaniah has been brought over into 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 3 through 6. Though we walk in the flesh, a human body, we don't war or fight according to the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, fleshly, but mighty in God for the pulling down of strongholds. The strongholds are things we could never do in our own strength. Verse 5, casting down reasonings and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God, bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. Here is where your problem is, your thinking, because you're thinking according to what your eye can see, what your physical body can do, the situations you're going through. But God simply says, I want you to take a look at something else. I want you to start thinking according to the word of God. Attack your problems with the knowledge of God. Attack Satan with the scriptures of God like Jesus did when Satan came against him and said, I'll give you all the kingdoms of the world. Jesus said to three temptations, it is written, it is written, it it is written. If we answered every problem with the word of God, our life would drastically change, but we just don't know it's in our wallet.
it. We just don't know it's in our pocket. We just don't know what the word of God has to say. That's why Jesus told us again, if you continue in my word, after you're born again, continue in my word, then are you my disciples indeed, and you'll know the truth and the truth will make you free. If you know the truth, he didn't say the word's gonna make you free any more than money in your pocket can be spent. It's gotta be pulled out and used. And that's what Jesus said. By pulling out the word of God and using it, you can have victory in every area of life. The Lord rejoices all through us with singing and with joy. Again, I told you like a mother with a baby thinks it's the most beautiful thing on earth. This is what God thinks of us. Our God is also a warrior. It doesn't matter how bad the situation we're going through is, God is always greater, more powerful than the problems. You know, we know that. We know the word of God says that, but here's the point. Even though the word of God says it, when's the last time you actually thought about it and used it and pulled a scripture out? Because you know what? You think about that when times are good. I'll just use a scripture next time. But when the problem comes along and we seem so overwhelmed by it, we keep thinking, what's one verse of scripture gonna do against this massive problem? The mind of Christ, the word of God, delivers us in every situation. That's why, again, God told us that. God promises us victory here in Zephaniah. Thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. He's not only given us victory, but always will give victory. The God who has brought you through before will bring you through again. Satan throws big problems at us, but we need to see our victory is always bigger, always greater, and will always come through. Just like the two spies that brought back a good report, we need to see our problems in comparison to God, not in comparison to us. As the 10 that brought back an evil report, the people that brought back the evil report saw what they saw with their physical eyes, but the two that brought back a good report said, no, no, we see our enemies standing next to God, not us standing next to our enemies. So again, they brought back a great report. The two that brought back a good report, that needs to be you. In the face of other Christians, you're outnumbered five times by people around you, even Christians who see things from the bad side, simply from their flesh, you need to see it through the things of God. When Jesus arrived in heaven after the resurrection, he brought us to heaven with him. He was so proud of us as a father with pictures of his children. Hebrews chapter two, verses 10 and 11 says this, for it was fitting for him, for whom are all things and by whom are all things in bringing me, in bringing many sons to glory, to make the captain of their salvation perfect through sufferings. For both he who sanctifies and those who are being sanctified are all from one, for which reason he's not ashamed to call them brethren. He is in our midst, he's inside of us. Jesus' father is our father. Jesus is our brother, but we're part of the same family and the same God that delivered Jesus through all the afflictions of life and even delivered him from the cross, the death and burial, raised him from the dead and seated him in heavenly places is the same God that will bring you out of your situations, out of the problems you're facing and cause you also to live in victory. He will rejoice over you like I'm sure all of heaven rejoiced over the resurrection, ascension, and seating at the right hand of the Father, Jesus Christ accomplished. He's also accomplished that for us. You know what? You need to wake up to these things. These scriptures are for you. The treasure you have right here, and you leave your Bible closed. You don't study it. You don't think about it. You're just glad you're going to heaven. Well, I'm glad I'm going to heaven too, but I don't want to just exist in life. I want the blessings of heaven to be given to me right here in life by following after the Lord Jesus Christ. Why don't you do the same thing too? I will see you right after the break. Who is God? Is it actually possible for a mortal human to communicate with the Creator even though God is a spirit? If we truly made in God's image and likeness, how are we like God? If we share similar attributes and characteristics, what are they? This 13 lesson teaching by Bobby Indian will increase your knowledge of the God of his universe. The Bible says, if you do not love, you do not know God because God is love. The more we know God, the greater our capacity to love. Do you want to increase your ability to love God, yourself, and those around you? As you listen to this teaching, you will be changed and become a greater expression of God in the world. In these lessons, you will learn about God's independence, his will, his infinite knowledge and greatness. You will see that he is unchanging, holy, omnipotent, faithful, good, and patient. You will learn of his mercy and also of his wrath. To order Knowing God, visit our website at bobyandian.com. Bob Yandian Ministries is training up a new generation in the Word of God. 
Because of your generosity and faithfulness, this teaching ministry is able to change countless lives. You will never know until you get to heaven how many people received Jesus, were filled with the Holy Spirit, healed, or found God's will for their life through your support and prayers. If you would like to become a partner with Bob Yandian, visit our website at bobyandian.com and click on Partnership. Pastors, if you would like to schedule Bob Yandian to speak at your church, event, or conference, go to bobyandian.com forward slash invite. All right, we're closing out this teaching on Zephaniah chapter 3, verses 17 through 20. I just want to rehearse you real quickly what verse 20 said. There comes a chosen time with God where he sees us coming through it. All it takes is for us to start seeing it through his eyes, not through our eyes. Verse 20 of Zephaniah chapter 3 says this, At that time, this is an appointed time for Israel where God knows the timing. He knows also when he's going to bring us out of a situation. We can put ourselves into that verse of scripture. Verse 20 says, At that time, I will bring you back, even at the time I gather you. For I will give you fame and praise among all the peoples of the earth when I return your captives before your eyes, says the Lord. What the Lord is simply saying again, those verses of scripture is this, is that God promises us he's going to bring us through. And we need to see at the same time, if all our enemies are laughing at us, some of those enemies will be gone. The problem is that some of your enemies are believers, but some of your uh, those that are harassing you and those coming against you are unbelievers. The unbelievers will be gone one of these days. The believers who have harassed you will be silenced. At that day, they will praise the Lord also with you for your deliverance that's coming. It simply comes back to it again, our God fights for us. We need to see it through his eyes. Remember again, the essence of the Christian life is seeing through the eyes of God, seeing your problems in the eyes of God, not comparing comparing yourself to the problem, but comparing God to the problem. And what are you, what is your trust in? Is your trust in God or are you looking at that problem thinking, how am I going to handle it? What in the world is going to happen? Looking at it in unbelief. You look at that thing in faith, you have to get your eyes on the Lord because faith sees it God's way. Our God is fighting for us as the warrior. And that verse of scripture in Zephaniah speaks to us so loudly. God promises us victory. In that verse of scripture, but the New Testament says again, thanks be to God who gives us the victories through our Lord Jesus Christ. Again, I'm going to reconfirm something I said just before the break. He has not only given us the victory, he always will give us the victory. Without him, we have no victory. If God be for us, who can be against us? Satan throws big problems at us, but we need to see our victory is always bigger than the problem and our deliverer is bigger than the one who delivered the problem to us. God is our deliverer. Satan has already been destroyed at the cross, has already been rendered null and void, and will one day literally be kicked clean off the plan. In the meantime, all he has is deception. And there's going to come a time, if God be for us, who can be against us? And we will say in that time, the Bible already prophesies it and says there's going to come a day, we're going to see Satan exposed for exactly who it is. And we're going to say, is this the one that deceived the nations? No wonder the New Testament says it this way, if God be for us, who can be against us? If you see how big God is, one day you'll actually see how small Satan was and how deceived you were to follow after him. Is this the one who deceived the nations? I come back to it again. The two spies that brought back a good report and 10 that brought back an evil report, the difference between the two and the 10 was simply this. The 10 that brought back the bad report said that, that we're like grasshoppers in their sight. They didn't ask them that. They assumed that. They assumed that these guys were looking at them saying how small they are. I mean, what did you do? Go up and knock on their knees in front of you because they were giants? Did you reach up and knock on their knees and say, hey, what do you think of us? Oh, we think you're grasshoppers in our sight. They didn't know what they really thought. We don't find that out later on to the book of Joshua when two spies went into t- to her place and she told them exactly what they had thought about Israel all that time. The two spies that brought back a good report saw the the giants compared to God. 
The 10 that brought back an evil report saw themselves in comparison to the giants. The two that brought back the good report didn't even mention themselves. They mentioned God and his promises and the giants. And they compared those two and said, God promised us, let's go take it. They'll be bread for us. In other words, we'll just march right through them. They have as much coming, they have as much power against us as a loaf of bread does. We will eat right through all of them. So again, they said there'll be bread for us. We'll just eat through them like we do through a meal. And so they didn't see the size of them. They saw the size of the blessing. They said, look at the size of these grapes. And the whole land looks like this. And God's already promised that we would have it. Promised in Deuteronomy, we live in houses we did not build. We would dig gold and brass and copper out of the hills. We would live in homes we didn't build and eat crops we did not plant. So again, later on, when the two spies, after 40 more years, 39 more years of wandering in the wilderness, and the first generation died off, and the second generation was going to conquer the land, two spies came to the city of Jericho and ended up at Rahab's house. And Rahab could not believe the Israelites did not believe God and possess the land earlier. Here's what she said. From the time that we heard God split the Red Sea, we knew this land belonged to you. And we were afraid the whole time. She basically said, our knees were knocking together for 40 years knowing this land belonged to you. And she said, how in the world did you not take this land earlier? And they almost had to laugh and say, because of 10 spies that came back and said that we look like grasshoppers your sight. She said, oh no, we knew this land belonged to you. And now we know it for sure. Basically what she said was, why did you take so long? We knew the land was yours. Didn't you know the land was yours? It's sad to know that a woman who was an unbeliever at the time, heard about that, except that when she said, and from the time we heard about it, she said, my house, my myself, my parents, this household, she said, we knew that the Lord, your God, was the God of heaven and the God of earth. They accepted the Lord and for 40 years waited for them to come in. That's why she hid the two spies. When Jesus arrived in heaven after the resurrection, he brought us to heaven with him. He brought those that were in paradise up to heaven with him. And this is our waiting place to come to. So he's in heaven waiting for us. And it says there, he was so proud of us. And he talked to the father about us, rejoiced over us, just as it says here in Zephaniah, Hebrews chapter two, verses 10 and 11. It was fitting for him for whom are all things and by whom are all things in bringing bringing many sons to glory to make the captain of their salvation perfect through suffering. Jesus said, I became perfected, matured through suffering. Every time I went through a suffering and stood on the word of God, I became stronger. You understand something? Satan sends uh, problems. Satan sends uh, situations to you through suffering to destroy you. But God says, no, I'm going to use the suffering, even though I didn't send it. I'm going to give you strength in it. And every time you fight the devil, you're going to come out stronger on the other side, more perfected on the other side, more mature on the other side. Verse 11 says again, for both he who sanctifies and those who are being sanctified are all from one, for which reason he's not ashamed to call them brethren. Whenever we're coming through problems, if you're coming through a problem right now and you're standing on the word of God, Jesus just puts his chest out. He doesn't care if he pops all the buttons off. He is so proud of you. And on top of that, when you get to heaven, he's going to rejoice over you like you cannot believe. He's rejoicing right now in heaven when you stand on his promises. We are the joy that was set before Jesus as he went to the cross. Like a mother going through travail before the child is born, Jesus went to the cross knowing the travail he had to go to, but we are the joy that was set before him. Why does a woman go through travail? Because she can see already that baby on the other side. Even though the baby's inside of her coming out of her womb, she's already anticipating that thing. And for the joy of what she's going to see, she'll put up with the problems now. For the joy that Jesus will see and saw on the cross, he looked forward to us coming and he rejoiced. And again, he saw uh, all that happen. And for that reason, the author, the finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, we also can endure temptations, trials, and tests from the devil, the persecutions and sufferings he sends, knowing what? On the other side, I'm coming out Satan stronger. Go ahead, Satan, throw your best at me because I'm coming out better on the other side. And when I do, I'm going to be standing. You're going to be on the mat. You've been able to knock me down a few times, but I've always got back up. 
But there's coming a time, Satan, I'm going to knock you down good by the promises of God. It's not me, it's Christ in me. But I'm going to use those promises and you're going to end up on the mat. I'm going to be the one standing up. Hebrews 12, 2 again, looking to Jesus. We look to him because he set the example. He's the author and the finish of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. What it's simply telling us in the book of Zephaniah is God will rest in his love for us. Literally, it means that God will rest. He will be revived. He will be renewed and be at peace in his love for us. And you know what? We also can rest. We can be at peace in his love for us. Those who have believed have entered into rest. This is what it tells us in the book of Hebrews. Here, the Lord is simply telling us, if we understand his love for us, why does God love to see us come through problems? It's because of his love for us. Why does he help us come through problems? It's because of his love for us. If he loved us as sinners, how much more does he love us as believers? If he loved us when we were not in the family, how much more does he love us now that we are in his family? If he loved us when we were children of Satan, how much more does he love us as children of God? If he loved us when we were spiritually dead, how much more does he love us because we're spiritually alive? Those who have believed have entered into to rest. And what do we wish? We rest on the love of God for us. And then it goes on to say, he will rejoice over us with singing. You know, there are three times in the Bible, it said that Jesus sings. Zephaniah chapter three, our chapter we started with in verse 17 says he sings over us. In Matthew chapter 26 and in verse 30, as the disciples partook of communion, then they left. They all sang a hymn together, including Jesus. But in Hebrews chapter 2 and verse 12, we just read it and that he sings over us. He sings over us. He sings out of the midst of us. Hebrews chapter 2 and verse 12 says that in the midst of the church, he sings praises to God. You know what that simply means? Jesus never sings by himself. He sings in the midst of believers. And in our verse, he sings over us too. He abides within us. So in essence, without us, Jesus has nothing to sing about. But think about this. Without Jesus, you have nothing to sing about. If Jesus Christ is bringing you through problems, you ought to be singing right now. Instead of waiting for the problem to come to an end, sing right now. Instead of being like uh, Miriam and waiting till you're through the Red Sea, then you pull out the tambourine and start singing. Why not sing in the midst of the problem? Why not look to the answer? And why not like Jesus did on the cross, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross? Why don't you look forward to the joy set before you? And the time to start singing and rejoicing is now, because why? We have Jesus and Jesus Christ has already won our major battle. So we're going to come through this small battle in the meantime. So without him, we can do nothing, but with him, we can do everything. Start your rejoicing now and rejoice in the love that God has for you. He's already prepared an answer in the midst of your problem. See you next time. Ministers, you can access valuable resources free at ministersclub.com. You'll find topical studies, sermon outlines, PDF books, answers to many questions, and plenty of encouragement, all free. Just go to ministersclub.com. You can order resources, become a partner, or browse free articles and podcasts by visiting our website at bobyandian.com. You can also join our mailing list and receive weekly devotions and the latest ministry updates. If you would like to contact Bob Yandian Ministries, visit bobyandian.com and click on Contact. To contact us by mail, use the address on your screen. Thank you for watching today's broadcast. We'll see you next time on Student of the Word with Bob Yandian.